Hi guys, I'm here with Amelia today and we are going to do a history, chess history stream on the Sicilian defense. Uh, so we'll be getting a history lesson and um, do you want to like introduce yourself and tell chat a little bit more about you before we start? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Amelia. I, I am currently a master's student at the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna. Uh, I'm getting my master's in the history of chess culture and modern European diplomacy. So um, I get to study chess every day, the history of it, at least, which is very fun. So cool. um, yeah. <laughs> awesome. How did you actually get into chess in the first place? Because I haven't asked you this. Uh, so I've been playing since I was four, but um, I'm from New Orleans, uh, Louisiana mm -hmm. in the U.S. And uh, chess is not really a big thing. We don't have a lot of tournament circuit circuit. So never played like professionally. But um, over the summer, after I graduated from my undergrad, I um, started writing a paper on basically like Bobby Fischer and the way that chess culture um, was used as a means of Russian diplomacy and decided to do my master's research on that as well. So that's so cool. Kind of that's an accident. So exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know that you could specialize in chess. Um, but it makes it makes a lot of sense. So um I also want to apologize because we've been trying to organize this stream for a really long time and I've had to reschedule twice and it's always been my fault. So uh, mm -hmm. I really appreciate your patience and thank you so much for agreeing to come on the stream. Uh, I'm thank very you for excited. Yeah, I'm super excited for this. And um, yeah, guys, don't for, don't forget to check Amelia out on Twitter. On Twitter. Okay, so um, if like chat has any questions, they're like good to ask throughout, right? And we can always yes. do like a Q&A at the end. Um, mm -hmm. But if, you know, if you're ready, then we can get into it. Sure. Um, yeah, please feel free to ask me anything um, and interrupt me. This is very casual. Uh, so I'm happy to, you know, answer any kinds of questions. Um, so basically the history of the Sicilian, this little presentation actually came about because I watched this like TEDx video on the origins of chess and it was just completely wrong. Like it just, Ready? It got, who gave it? Yeah. It was, uh, like, it was a little animated video that like TEDx oh, did. Okay. okay. You can look it up on YouTube. It's really I'm bad. Really <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I started uh, doing some research on like, you know, the history and origins of modern chess. So if you want to mm -hmm. like go to the next slide, uh, but basically the chess that we know and love today started in the 15th century in like Southern Europe, mostly Spain, because that was like the predominant political power at the time. Um, and one of the oldest books that we have is a book by a guy named Luis Ramirez de Lucena. Um, he wrote, um, it's, t it's translation is basically the repetition of love in the art of playing chess. It was published in 1497. Um, so that's like one of the oldest books we have. It's that little book on the right, um, mm -hmm. with the, you know, chess board on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, and is, sorry, go ahead. Can, sorry. Can I ask questions? Is this yeah, like, course. um, I don't know if you, you'll know the answer. Is this like before, they changed the queen to being like the best piece or um yeah this is before yeah. they changed the queen to being the best piece okay. and so in okay. this book i have a i don't know if it, so if you go to the next slide mm -hmm. um and i won't it's i this isn't like old spanish and my specialization mm -hmm. is not in like <laughs> translation of old languages mm -hmm. <laughs> but basically this like outlines the rules of chess um mm -hmm. And so that's like one of the first pages. And let me see if I can, I, sorry guys, I have the presentation like up on my computer screen. And so um, on the right hand side, the top like title says, uh, Siguen uh, de las reglas. Sorry, my Spanish is really bad. But basically I that's like. Spanish, so don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically that's like the chapter that starts outlining like the the rules of chess um and so if you go to the next page there's more like um there's more kind of outlined basically so it's cool. showing you how thanks um I love <laughs> I love looking at old books it's a lot of fun 
Uh, but basically, like, if you see, it's similar to the way that we have, like, now, you know, how, like, a white square has to be at the right side of the chessboard. That's basically, mm-hmm. like, what these two pages are talking about and, like, why. Um, and so this is, like, when we think about chess today, uh, this is kind of where it all started, which is, mm-hmm. I think, pretty fascinating to think that, like, really old people in from very far away times were like playing chess um like the same game of chess that we're playing now exactly and so (laughs) um you go to the next slide um i love these pictures they're so cringy (laughs) 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 but basically like these two guys their names are uh giolio poleto poletio and then uh giochino greco those were like the two, like the Magnus Carlsen and like Ding Liren of chess. Like they were the top players. The guy on the left, he was basically like a chess theory guy um, mm-hmm. and kind of like coached Greco uh, a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and he started like a chess school in Naples in like the 1600s. Um, absolutely. 1500s, there's traps for sure. I, I actually, I want a portrait of myself painted similar to this maybe one day um yeah that would be great it's like (laughs) um (laughs) but basically (laughs) uh poledio created these like because so they had correspondence chess but Mm -hmm. if you think like correspondence chess back in the day was literally written on like pen with pen and paper like no lee chess no (laughs) chess.com so um he created these like codexes, these like huge books of games being played by people in Italy, in France, in Spain. And I have pictures later that I'll show you. But then the guy on the right, Greco, he was considered like the first professional chess player. And he, from an early age, had a knack for chess. And But the thing is, he was not actually educated. Um, and so he made a living by playing chess um so yeah basically the first like Mm -hmm. professional chess player yeah and he lived during the time of like ruby lopez uh you know he obviously Mm -hmm. did the spanish opening and also Mm -hmm. uh philidor uh who is actually the guy which we will see in a in a few seconds (laughs) um is the first person to publish like the sicilian as like an opening Oh, so wow. we'll go to the next slide. Oh, the Monopoly man. <laughs> Wait, is that yeah. the Monopoly man or the Pringles man? I never know. They're like the same person to me. Do you think that's? The same? I think. I think when I googled rich person, I put in rich guy Monopoly man. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> it's okay. I don't know the difference between them either. <laughs> um. Basically, there were two really big influences on chess Mm -hmm. during this time period. It was rich people Mm -hmm. um, because rich people were the ones that financially supported people who were really good at playing chess. So like Greco, he was supported by rich people Um, Mm -hmm. and poor people like were not really playing chess during this time. Yeah, Um, they were busy like working. Yeah, working, working. (laughs) <laughs> being artisans um <laughs> mm-hmm. and if there were like i haven't been able to find any record of it so you mm-hmm. know don't take my exact word for it but from what i've seen in the archives there's um not really a lot of people so also rich people were the only ones that could afford like a formal education during this time so mm-hmm. if you think about it like rich people who were educated were the ones that knew how to play chess and so they passed it on to other rich people who knew how to play chess <laughs> and so um basically like especially with correspondence chess they were the ones who knew how to read and write and so they could play correspondence chess but basically during this time period rich people were the ones that were playing chess and so their ideas were the ones influencing like how the game of chess was played mm-hmm. and also the renaissance was a big influencer on chess because uh during the renaissance there was a gradual but like widespread education reform and so as the renaissance kind of expanded uh you have you know 
people who are beginning to become educated, who are, you know, the first in their families to be able to like mm-hmm. play chess. Um, but also I'm not a Renaissance historian. Uh, I'm modern, like American slash European historian. So mm-hmm. it's, a uh, in terms of that, like also kind of, you hear about like the romantic era of chess. Um, that's kind of like similar to this time period, not exactly, but, um, a version of that is happening like in the chess world or with people who are playing chess. Cause I would, I would say it's hard to define a chess world at this time because, Mm -hmm. you know, not everyone is super connected, but, um, and there's not like, you know, the integration and globalization and like tournaments that we have today, but I digress (laughs) not to go off on a tangent. Um, and on the next slide, actually, this has, kind of to do with the renaissance this was painted during like the renaissance period but if you look at the chess table the guy um which one is he he is i'm pretty sure the guy in like the orange stripes yeah that's uh that's ruby lopez (gasps) really he's kind of cute yeah this is a pain he's kind of cute right yeah that's my kind of like more (laughs) than expected hold on let me zoom in for chat i think i can zoom in yeah this guy. Yeah. <laughs> Smash your pass, guys, for reason Smash best. your pass, really. <laughs> pass. <laughs> yeah, I got a Zoom. To be fair, though, um, like most of them have pretty sick outfits. Like, I love this dress on the right. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I would honestly want to go back to this time period just for the outfits. Yeah, but probably not for um, like, the hygiene or. Um, no, not yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> so um but yeah this is like it's so cool it's like one of my favorite paintings but like Mm -hmm. it just goes to show you like how you know the aristocracies they were the ones like playing playing chess and Mm -hmm. they were the ones like influencing the game and like spreading it to people so Mm -hmm. uh he does have nice legs whoever said that in the chat i agree (laughs) i'm trying to look like that (laughs) trying to work out Uh, so um if we keep going on to the next slide uh basically um the sicilian was written down by Pol- poledio and greco from like fif- between 1575 and 1600 there's not a real date like we see it a bit in like the codexes which is mm-hmm. this little like uh, on the left like you would have to zoom in they it used mm-hmm. to have be published online and then i think like a university press republished it and so you have to like buy the book oh. now to yeah. see the codexes but um it was like finally formally published in 1777 mm-hmm. by um francois philidor um who obviously is the founder or you know he invented the philidor opening mm-hmm. uh Basically, yeah. like the two. I can't he did that. It's so annoying. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, how dare you? The, how dare you do that? Um, the two main differences, basically, in this. I mean, obviously, mm-hmm. like the moves are the same, but yeah. Um, the one thing I love to know is the notation because it's not like it's not algebraic notation at all because. Algebraic notation didn't come around until like the 1980s, like standardized. But, um, but if you yeah. see, like it says, like the king's pawn two moves. <laughs> like this I is just like the, the most way inefficient it. notation I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> the queen to bishop. Imagine if pawn. you were like playing a game and like you had to write every move like that with like an entire sentence. I don't think Magnus Carlsen would be world champion if he had to write it like that. <laughs> but <laughs> it'd be really hard. Games would take like 12 hours. <laughs> yeah, they would. Um, uh, this is but, really cool. I can zoom in for you. chat. Um, oh, wait, yeah, there are also like notes. And if chat, like I will post this on, I have, obviously yeah. I have a Twitter, um, but also I have a website and I'll post this like presentation and like links mm-hmm. to look at this stuff on my website too. Um, yeah. but basically like there's like notes of the way that like Philidor kind of like notated like why moves would be a certain way. Um, and then, uh, on the last page, like we can just 
like quickly skim but basically this is actually i was able to find Mm -hmm. (laughs) i was able to find um like a bit of the codex and so if you look like in the 1500s this is how they were annotating chess and it like absolutely makes no sense and on the final page uh yeah on the final like slide but oh my uh that's just like a little bit of chess notation for you like a history of chess notation but um mm-hmm. yeah the sicilian was greatly influenced by you know the renaissance and rich people and um it uh and the two guys you know greco and poliero like uh why is the bishop's s written like that um so how they the right s's yeah that's just how With they like used to write s's yeah mm-hmm so it, it makes um, you feel like they're always speaking with like a lisp right <laughs> that's so true whenever i read it I'm, i like read it with a lisp yeah it's really hard i really struggle because i did um i studied like middle english at university and a lot of them like texts were like this and it's just like really it's like really awkward because everyone's got a lisp <laughs> makes everything way, sound way less cool when you're reading it Wait, that's so cool you studied uh you studied middle english is that what you said yeah because um basically like the the university that i went to was like very old and they are like they specialize in like literary like medieval like medievalism and stuff um so i had to do uh chaucer like a lot of chaucer um that's yeah it's just cool. pronounced like a, a normal s guys it's just it's just a i don't know a weird little quirk um that's so cool though i mean do you know like why (laughs) they decided to play like c5 um or do we have no i mean i we don't really know i mean if we look at uh Mm-hmm. If we look at Philidor's notes, like he says, mm-hmm. like the way of opening a game when you have not the move is absolutely defensive and very far from being the best, uh, mm-hmm. especially if some advantage is granted, but it is the very good one to try and strengthen the yeah. adversary with the whole skill you are like unacquainted. So, I mean, I guess like just from Philidor, we can assume that he, you know, is wanting to play a bit more defensive and not um, like because I guess obviously also I've told Lula this but I mean I'm not a professional chess player really and so yeah at all. no I I, so. I mean I'm sure chess theory was like very rudimentary uh, like mm-hmm. until these guys came along and they were still figuring it out um I was looking at this much more modern chess game um this week from like the late 19th early 20th century and Mm -hmm. there are loads of like uh miniatures like really short games like under even 15 moves and it's just like grandmasters getting mated in like 10 moves and it's like but you're a grandmaster like why are you getting checkmated in the opening (laughs) um but yeah I I think um we take a lot of the like oh this is just a good move I think we take a lot of that for granted now because we have like centuries of data and like other people getting checkmated in 10 moves to prove it um (laughs) yeah and I mean during that time that you were like with the game you were looking at Mm -hmm. because there's like different eras of chess I don't know if you've heard of this but there's like the romantic era and then like the scientific era that's when they were playing chess like very um like attack or defense like they weren't really thinking a lot of moves ahead so Mm -hmm. um like it's when you think of your chess games you know it's so easy to like compare it to oh is this kind of like a romantic style of playing Mm -hmm. like Paul Morphy uh the like very old chess player from New Orleans he was very like romantic style of chess like he loved Mm -hmm. thinking about like the complexity of the game and like how can you make this game just like so beautiful as like almost like an art form which is how I like see chess a lot of the time so Mm -hmm. yeah no that's one of the reasons that I really like and enjoyed chess when I first took it up like that's one of the I think that's probably one of the reasons that I decided to actually start playing at all was like because I realized how complex and like beautiful it could be and it's mm-hmm. I think it's something unless you start playing chess you just don't get yeah 
I agree. But yeah. that is my little mini history of the Sicilian. If anyone has any questions, feel free to, you know, put it in the chat or, you know, tweet me on Twitter. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any questions. I feel like I don't really know anything about the history of chess, so I don't know what questions to ask. <laughs> no, that's okay. I mean, I think that my biggest takeaway, so I told Lula this, is um, mm -hmm. I recently was just appointed to FIDE's historical committee, and so I'm hoping to, like, Thank you. Chat, guys. That's, that's so exciting. That's very cool. Thanks. I'm super excited. It's um, mm -hmm. I so I really want chess history to like be accessible to a lot of people. I find mm -hmm. it super fascinating. I think chess players and the whole chess community is um. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you like my presentation. I don't like putting a lot of words in my presentation, so I mostly just put pictures. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's but, the right way to do it because otherwise people yeah. will like read and not listen to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah thanks and so I um but yeah I just want chess history to be like super accessible I have um is there a good spot to read more about chess history um there's a lot of information online the uh, I am publishing an article actually on the first of December uh about uh how chess culture influenced Russian diplomacy so if you like want to read that just be on the lookout follow me on Twitter um and That's very cool I think there are a lot of when you read like chess books, there's actually like a lot of history kind of in between the lines of like books, especially I have a book here. Actually, it's called The Brussels Encounter um, and uh, Kasparov and a bunch of like other like big grandmasters at the time uh, annotated it. And it's really interesting to like see kind of their commentary on like what's going on at the tournament while they're also analyzing games. So just like, you know, pay attention in your chess books, like chess history is everywhere. That's what I like to tell people. So, yeah, I, f I feel like um that's my favorite part of chess books, to be honest, is like the context and all of the little um like author's notes and like, oh, I played this game at this tournament and I met this person and then they told me about this. And it's like it's yeah, I feel like a lot of chess is um, like translated that way. Uh, but it would be cool if um there were more like articles and stuff. So I'm really excited to read yours when it comes out. Um, someone in chat was asking your like affiliation with FIDE, like officially. Um, like... I am officially a member of the FIDE Historical Committee. Um, I, again, I don't play chess professionally, so I don't have like an ELO or anything. Please don't ask me my rating. I literally made a chess.com account for this stream like three hours ago. <laughs> um I, yeah but I you play, don't need to play chess to know about history true, or to have an interest but I do, the thing is i do play chess but mm -hmm. i play chess at this club in vienna with all these old guys that's um, so cute and it's like very fun and so that's how i play chess i just play for fun um i think that's the best but, way to play chess yeah mm -hmm. so that is my affiliation with fide i'm just a member of the historical committee and then um i yeah i'm obviously like getting my master's in this uh yeah <laughs> mm -mm. does the queen denote a woman if yes why a woman um well originally it wasn't a queen was it and in some languages it's still like a what's it like a con con i don't know and so, i'm pretty sure in some languages the queen is still not a queen I'm, I think it's like yeah. a, yeah, um, advisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not mm -hmm. coconut, not concubine, no. Uh, <laughs> advisor, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not always feminine in every language. Um, but I guess because chess has all these connotations, I'm sure you know more about this than I do, all these connotations of being like a royal game, it makes sense for there to be a queen if there's a king. Uh, it's very... Um, you know, if it's like a courtly game, which I'm like historically it has been, mm -hmm. it makes sense for to be a king and a queen. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, it definitely, it never, it didn't always, you know, denote a queen or like a woman. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're right, it was advisor. And so um, 
But I think by the time that, again, like not a Renaissance historian, but like by the time that, you know, Chess decided to kind of switch the um, the names of the, you know, uh, pieces from uh, like advisor to queen, it's because like at the time, you know, obviously, especially in Spain, Spain is a very like patriarchal society. It's very like... Um, it very much sticks to like the two gender structure. And so when renaming it, I think it uh, they were like very regal in it and wanted to do King and Queen. Yeah. And I think the Queen piece was um, adjusted. I thought it was based on Queen Isabella um, to, because the Queen could previously only move one square and now it can move as many as it wants but I read in Jen Shahadi's book Chess Queens that that was like a variant of chess when it was first introduced um Mm -hmm. and people like mocked it and thought that it wouldn't catch on and um Jen said that they called it like the mad woman's chess or something because it was insane to make the queen so powerful as like the female piece but it eventually became adopted as the main form of chess and it's the only one we play now I love who um, I love what this person put in uh, the chat, basically, like how communist sets don't have the cross on the king because they didn't like the monarchy or religion, whereas like European ones do. Like, that's very true. If you look at um, a lot of Russian chess sets, they don't have that. like the cross. On it. Yeah, really? Because... That's, that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I had no yeah. idea. Chess history is everywhere. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um. What do you think about the if if your like specialization in your like um upcoming article is about like Cold War chess? What did you I'm sorry, you must be bored of these questions. What did you think about like the Queen's Gambit and like the Cold War undertones? And do you think they should have addressed it more? Sorry, this is like I, completely off topic. No, that's totally <laughs> okay. I um I actually really like the Queen's Gambit. Um mm-hmm. I actually didn't I'll be honest, I didn't watch it until fairly recently. That's really um fine. so I uh but I really liked it. I think that I'm actually really glad that they didn't address the Cold War undertones because I feel like that would have taken away from like the story of Beth and like yeah. you know, obviously the like struggles of being a woman in chess, especially like during that time period. Um I was actually reading uh there is a sports illustrated article that was published in 2018 on Lisa Lane. Um I don't know if you know who that is. But she was a women's national champion yes. in the US. I read about her in Chess Queens, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But she was like a really huge advocate for, you know, women in chess. And like she, a big part of like her kind of persona was, you know, the fact that she was like very standardly beautiful. And like that is a mm-hmm. way that she attracted the media to like pay attention to chess and especially like women in chess. And I don't know. I, resonated a lot of her story with you know the story of the queen's gambit and so um i'm kind of glad they didn't address the cold war undertones but i think for me especially like as someone who's now affiliated with fide i think it's important to like acknowledge like how chess has been used as like a propaganda tool by you know the russian government and um the way that it you know impacts the lives of chess players and the chess community so Hmm. Yeah, there's this theory that, I don't know if you remember, but there's, um, I don't remember her name, the um, French woman in The Queen's Gambit, um, Mm -hmm. who Beth meets, and then they get drunk together before her match against Borgov and she loses. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's like this theory that she's like a Russian spy and it's just not addressed in the show. Uh, yeah it, it's know. really not I I saw that theory and I was like kind of yeah. intrigued I was like, yeah I couldn't believe that for sure <laughs> I couldn't believe it yeah did you I'm sorry this is just me asking more irrelevant questions did you watch Porn Sacrifice it's a no. film um you should you should, I, I you should watch it um a lot of people didn't like it uh I watched it when I had only been playing chess for like a week so I don't really remember if it was good or not like from a chess player's yeah. perspective uh but it's like about bobby fisher and it's like um this is like directed and um stars to- toby Maguire, spider-man was he spider-man i'm not sure Ooh. but it's got like really really like uh 
it has way more Cold War stuff. Like it uh, addresses it a lot more in mm-hmm. terms of like paranoia. Uh, and um, it's like a really different take, I guess, on like chess in like a similar like period. I don't think it's super uh, accurate to Bobby Fischer. Like it's very like stylized um, yeah. for the screen. But I thought it was interesting when I watched it. Um, I will say. Yeah, I know a lot of I- people didn't like it. I haven't seen it, but I will say I try not to watch things about Bobby Fischer just because I find that it clouds like my yeah. ability to like critique him as a person. Um, just Fair because enough. as incredible as a player, he like he was an incredible player, very problematic person. Like yeah. Um but yeah. if you a book that I um a book that I really, really liked that I suggest to everyone is Endgame by Frank Brady. It's uh, okay. he was like a close confidant of Fisher and he um, his book kind of like on the life of Fisher is very interesting, especially because like even though he was his friend, he doesn't like shy away from um, criticizing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's like really interesting. It's, it was a, it's, a, it's a really good book. And I would love I to have you good. to have you back on if you'd like to at some point come and talk about some other kind of chess history, like maybe when your paper is published or, or we could talk about Cold War stuff or something. Um, For sure, that'd be fun. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yay. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate all of your time today. See you. Okay. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.